Okay, it's uh, starting and we should go in less than uh, 10 seconds. Antonio. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to ask one question. Um, I have a link to, um, to uh, one Google form with, uh, with a very short quiz for the audience. Is it possible to share the link on um, the YouTube channel or on the YouTube sure. strip, streaming page? I will send you the link. With, uh, with a very short quiz for the audience. Sure. Sorry, I was repeating everything, and now the live is open. So I will love to welcome you, everyone uh, of you who will be uh, watching, of course, also this video on live and our first broadcasting from Future Teen Mexico. Um, Every of the guests and the speakers who will be today with us are from different countries, different sides of the world. And uh, now that it's uh, midday here in Mexico of our time, and it's already night there that we have the connection. First of all, in Russia with Anastasia Saharova, we have also another uh, like a city and another country who is Uzbekistan uh, and the representative of uh, this place is Azamat Tolipov. And finally, we have Oman with our friend and colleague Fahad Alabri. So welcome for all of you guys and thanks a lot for being here with us. Thank you. Thank you. Guys, so, well, we are starting a week of a, a whole, um, like, uh, sent or actions and conference and debates that we will have, and it's all related to environment, which is also a subject, a topic where you are, whether an expert, whether, whether an activist, whether a volunteer in many, in many sense, and uh, that is the, the reason we opened this, this forum and this discussion. And uh, well, that's it. I mean, actually, the title and the subject that we have for today is is this one: environmental advocacy. And what is this? I mean, we can uh, have and create many kind of ways and actions towards the environmental uh, protection of the whole environment and many other things, which is not just recycling, but also in science uh, and many many things. So we will. That is why we will listen for this today. Um, so guys, I would love to start with uh, Anastasia Saharova and having a brief introduction uh, of Anastasia, who is uh, now a, a former student of the Moscow Institute, uh, Moscow State Institute of International Relations, and a former um, student of the of the environmental program. And today she is uh, an advisor for the MGIMO Goes Green. Uh, so here is um, Anastasia with us, Saharova, and I will I will let you speak for now. Thank you. Uh, well, I will briefly um, tell about myself again a little bit. Uh, yes, that's right. I am. Um, I graduated from the Moscow State Institute of International Relations or MGIMO University last year uh, from a program named International Environmental and Economic Problems. And currently I, um, I am in the university again doing my master's in the field of economics. And um, the topic of my master's paper, master thesis is um, responsible investment uh, and environmental factors in responsible investments, uh, green obligations, and so on, and so forth. Um, then I was doing my bachelor degree. I was um, for a while a president of the student club on Mgimo Goes Green um, in 2017 and 2018. And our uh, during that time, we uh, became a prize winner of Moscow Government Environmental Award for what we were doing and what exactly uh, Gimo Goes Green does. Um, I'm going to expand on that. Well, um, first of all, um, as a result of our uh, action, Gimo become a part of the Russian Association of Green Universities and we are doing um, some 
uh, events and actions are as a part of that association now. Um, we are also um, doing recycling in the university, paper and batteries um, all the time. And um, uh, some mm, like uh, temporary actions uh, for collecting plastic bottles and broken electronic devices. Uh, we also held some forums and conferences or with international participation and uh, participants from all, all of the Russia. Um, they were, for example, Global Climate Change Conference in 2016. Uh, it was, uh, in a sense, a model of the UN of, of uh, Conference of the Parties of the UN Framework Convention for Climate Change. Then in 2018, uh, we held a model of the World Water Forum, which was also uh, extremely interesting. And our um, annual Eco Solution Cup event is a competition, is a case study competition for participants from all over the country. And sometimes we do special sections for international uh, international participants and we held we hold it annual since annually since 2014. Uh, we also uh, organize round tables lectures um, and participate uh, from uh, from the name of the Mgimo University participate in many other events uh, on environmental and climate uh, topics that take place in Moscow and other cities of Russia. And probably our main environmental advocacy activity is our posts in a uh, public page in the VK. Uh, Contact here is a Russian social media. Um, yeah, and also, here in Russia, we have such thing as uh, UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals Youth Envoy for Russia. And uh, some of our um, activists from Gimma Goes Green are, was, uh, were or are uh, such envoys for uh, environmental goals like number six, clean water and sanitation, number of 14 life below water, number 15 life on land. And I also know that many other students of Mickey Moore University are, um, are the envoys of the SDGs. Um, for example, the 17th goal uh, partnership, uh, the goal number five, gender equality, a friend of mine is currently an envoy. So, um, we have many bright students here. What else does our university do uh, for environment and climate and SDGs? Uh, this is of course the research, research in that fields. Uh, we have um, two, I would say two uh, departments that uh, conduct research in that field, in the field of sustainability. Uh, mainly, of course, it's uh, the department I am graduated from. It's the uh, Department of International Conflicts, International Environmental and Economic Problems, and also the Department of International Economic Relations. We have uh, several professors who um, do their research in that field. So, they have many publications. Um, also, uh, the president of Mgimo University, Anatoly Vasilich Turkunov, uh, is uh, a chairperson of Russia, uh, Russian um, Russian uh, Association of the United Nations Cooperation. If I if I am translating it right. Um, which means that uh, the expertise of our of our professors, of our teachers, uh, is used to make research or make um, some analytics or give an advice for um, 
how should we actually achieve the SDGs in Russia? Um, My dear, yeah. yes. Now we will we will love, of course, to um, uh, ask more about uh, what, for example, kind of uh, research and how Russia, for example, today is having uh, well this responsibility in all terms regarding the Paris Agreement, regarding uh, everything related uh, on their environment, not just, uh, let's say, Russia itself, the citizens, of course, and the government, but also what uh, you are part of the team of the MGIMO, MGIMO goes green. And for that, well, of course, uh, uh, remembering our, our subject, which is uh, this advocacy that you are mentioning now, and, and that we can we can see it of course let's make a discussion on this I will I will love to uh, because we continue on, on the conversation and, and uh, come back with this kind of uh, if you can please answer to us this kind of uh, examples of the of the research or one of the important things that are currently going on um, uh, for for now I will really also love to hear, what is happening as well? Uh, let's compare on the on the side that what a university is doing, what a state institute in Russia, and also now uh, from the social uh, side of the of the movement uh, that we as citizens we can uh, like create, and that is the example now of uh, also Fahad Alabri, who has uh, found the move uh, this like initiative of move green as well. And, uh, and well, I think that is will be the comparison and as well, what is doing Asamat as a student of the of the university in Iceland, and we will be comparing this this kind of thing. So please, I would love to to have now a brief uh, uh, or uh, well, of course, the, the introduction and the intervention of Fahad Alabri on this comparison that we can also do as as uh, global citizens. Hey guys, uh, my name is Fahad Labri, founder of Move Green, and uh, we are an initiative based in Sultanate of Oman, and we are based on promoting environmental awareness through creativity and activity. Of course, um, the social level, it has, uh, I think it's the bigger piece of society that needs to be, uh, be aware of the environmental challenges and the issues beside the academic side and the political directions of it. But uh, in general, I believe always environment solutions can always be approached based on collective effort. And uh, this is the biggest challenges that uh, I think some organizations face or some places face. The environment, uh, it wasn't only an organization problem, whether it's governmental or a, or a private problem. The, it's not a, a one person responsibility or only a certain group of people's responsibility. It's everyone's responsibility even whoever is watching this video or whoever who's attending this video, it's everyone's responsibility. I think real success is if we manage to share this responsibility with everyone from the younger person society to the older person society and to know how to learn how to, to live together. Um, I believe uh, there's a huge gap between um, many organizations uh, from an academic aspect to a social level aspects, um, governmentals and private sectors, there's a, there's, a, there's a huge gap and probably this, this gap is based on ego. But uh, I will leave uh, the respect of this conversation for later on if anyone wants to ask a question about it. But uh, we as a small, small, small team, the way how we started in general, uh, it was funny. Um, we started from a small jingle, not even a song, from a jingle, from a jingle. Uh, I made it small with a ukulele, with this instrument, and uh, it went viral on social media. Kids start to sing it. Famous people, because of ego, didn't participate. But then again, somehow it became a movement. And suddenly, once we started to step in and to start to clean up, we found that it's a campaign. And from a small campaign, it turned up to an initiative because the people wanted it to be an initiative. What came to understanding this, it was an eye opener to me to realize that art is very important because it what touches the emotional element of a human being 
and what also translate the information of an academic sources. So we need mechanisms to, to bring academic references and to find way of collaboration systems, maybe it's governmental or private, and to invest this in the right direction of human emotions. And that's where it brings us to the next level, where, which is human awareness. And uh, I realized some of the approach of many awareness messages was, um, I would say, poor and weak because uh, they didn't really manage to change anything in people's behavior in general. And there is only a certain level of society or certain group of society who really cares about the environment because simply uh, there was a strong wave of a capitalist approach and the environment always will come second and money comes first and companies and organizations have pushed through this but we can see with the COVID-19 environment is recovering and at the same time uh, the uh, the approach is getting better so I, I realized I realized based on this um, what we need is what we need is to understand is how we can deliver this message to society and uh, Yes, I am an informal learner. I am not a formal learner. I didn't went to school to study really environmental awareness. I didn't went to school to just to study environment, environmental advocacy. But also leadership is very important because leadership, it means you have to carry the initiative forward and then you have really to inspire the people who's coming with you. And there's a big proportion of size of the civilians who are in the younger age. They, they needed environmental examples to see what's going on. And I believe as an adult, it is our responsibility to deliver this message to the kids and also to show them that the environment is a collective effort. So what I'm really looking for is, and what we're really asking everyone is to be, is to find more mechanisms, more mechanisms of understanding how to work together to achieve one ultimate goal. Sometimes these mechanisms can come in the place or the face of a conflict of interests. But we have to realize, especially after the COVID-19, that money is not everything. Many organizations are stressing themselves out to look for the financial level, and I'm not denying it, it's important, but we have to realize that the environment and earth is something very important for us more than anything else. So, um, that's going to bring me back to one more question. Uh, do we really have to come back to normal? And that's uh, the very big question of the COVID-19. And I will absolutely said um, maybe normal is the problem. And it's also a good thing. And I got this as an inspiration from someone uh, online. Uh, but I realized that normal, it is really the problem. Normal it is really the problem. So we need to question our values. That's for sure. And we need to find more mechanisms of collaboration and sometimes if they are simple, we just have to understand how to direct them. And I believe art is a very big solution, especially in our side, in our direction, art made a huge impact. And now it's an initiative from just a small little jingle. It's not even a song. The song is a too serious. It's a jingle and it managed to drive through. So yeah, if there is anyone really um, would love to drop a question on that, um, I'm all ears and heart for it. That is for sure. That is for sure, Fahad. And actually, now that we are trying to to uh, share uh, one of these examples that you are mentioning, maybe it's uh, we cannot listen to it. Let's try. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. So, so you can see what what happened in that is the small little jingle. This one I made it in Arabic. And surprisingly, it started to reach to Yemen, to Egypt, to Bahrain, and different countries in the region. And I, I didn't really plan that. It was, it was, a, it was. I was surprised, but they felt what's going on. There is an emotional value to what the environment has, and that was treasured from the little song. And then now these kids, I dare anyone really litter in front of them, and that's what's bring us and telling us that they are the hope of the future so we need we need just to direct all these energies to the right as aspects and we need to find mechanisms of how we can really connect with the people in a very professional organization but also to connect with people with the in a younger age and this is and that's a success 
I'm receiving messages from home, people say, uh, parents, that their kids asking them to not use plastic, their kids are asking them not to use that, just from a small little songs. And, and that's the beauty of it. It just, I believe the environment has been in, in denial for the very last, uh, I would say 10 years from now, or maybe even more than that, to be honest. But then again, the environment needs attention and we need, we need to create more creative contents for that. And these creative contents are the mechanisms or it could be even digitalized in many different ways. But now we are in a time where we can actually create these opportunities. That is for sure. And my dear Fahad, well, let's go back again. Also, uh, there are two questions you, you just mentioned now. And there is also one thing we will cover now in the discussion which is the position and also one very important like dynamic we will we will share and we just uh, write it down here on the youtube channel and as well on here in in uh, our zoom meeting which is uh, a form uh, of google that asamat tolipov from uzbekistan will tell us more about this and of course now we will go back to those uh, like specific uh, questions or uh, subjects that Anastasia Saharova from the beginning, she was telling us how a university is doing research. And then now we, we could see the comparison on uh, how we all as, as young entrepreneurs and, uh, and uh, activists, we, we can do something even though uh, we don't have this uh, like master or bachelor in our studies in environment, but we are actually have a very important action towards uh, these, these, uh, all these subjects that are for us today. And as well as, as Anastasia also was saying, well, uh, it was related to the SDGs. Uh, there is an agenda which every country uh, is, is signing and it's adopting uh, different measures regarding the, yeah, of course, environmental awareness, but environmental action. So that is why now I go uh, to present um, it's our friend again. I, I repeat it. Sorry, from uh, Uzbekistan, Asamat Tolipov, um, a graduate from the University of Iceland, which in a master uh, of science in geology and uh, glaciology, or entering in geology. Um, the university centering in is Balvard, it's a North Close Exchange program, and also, well, uh, honors from the Bachelor in Geology in the National University of. Uzbekistan. Azmat, uh, thank you for being with us also and welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Antonio, for introducing me. Um, uh, hello, everyone. Um, uh, so um, I'm Azamat, and um, I, even, I, even if I'm a student at the University of Iceland studying mostly geology and um, glaciology and, and currently interested in polar research, I would say. So I'm um, basically interested in uh, doing research in understanding or in, in, in order to contribute to the humanities understanding uh, to, of uh, how polar uh, regions are changing, how the coldest or icy regions are changing in the world. Uh, so uh, let me just uh, first share um, uh, my screen. I'd like to share uh, my screen, uh, Antonio, is it possible? So, so far it's saying that uh, the host uh, disabled the uh, screen sharing. Yeah, sure, let me give you the permission. <laughs> Ready. Yeah, yeah, got it. There we go. Can you guys see it? Is it visible, guys? Yep. All right, cool. So uh, my today's um, presentation is mostly about the uh, how I usually like to refer to it, climate crisis, uh, rather, rather than just climate change. Um, all right, uh, I will uh, shortly touch on uh, all, all of these uh, points here that, that uh, listed right on the slides, which um, is going to start with uh, my understanding of why. Uh, the climate crisis is not react, uh, reacted as it is a crisis and why people uh, didn't, do not react to it as quickly as they react to some social problems like poverty and like sickness uh, or COVID and so on. And, and later, 
I will talk about the how science explains uh, why this is a climate crisis and how climate uh, has been changing in a nutshell. So in a, in a very short speech. Uh, later, I will, uh, if you, the guys, in case, in case you are not familiar, I will introduce you to uh, the um, like solutions part of the problem, which is uh, basically um, the IPCC, uh, which as an organization and uh, the reports they produce, after which I will uh, uh, you know, talk about how uh, environmental problems, especially the climate change problems can be addressed in, in, with economic aspects incorporated. And later I will touch on an, a very, very interesting international project called Drawdown. And later I'll uh, you know, point out to some examples um, uh, which uh, I, I have observed in Uzbekistan. Okay. Uh, so this is me standing in the background. Um, this, this picture can be a, an answer to the question why, what I personally do to uh, somehow personally contribute to tackling this problem. Right? First of all, I've switched my lifestyle to biking. I'd say 99% of my travel uh, the, you know, throughout the city is, the, is biking only. Um, and I also minimized eating meat. I also buy less and I buy things like clothing and stuff only when uh, it is extremely necessary. All right. Uh, so in general, it's, uh, I try to somehow try to follow the principle of uh, reducing, reusing, recycling, and refusing. Um, and I'm uh, like, uh, I'd like to point out that uh, understanding or reacting to the climate problem is not as quick or as uh, very easy to understand as uh, social problems like poverty and sickness, like COVID and so on. Uh, in my understanding, it is because uh, you know the consequences or effects or impacts of uh, the climate crisis on human beings, on humanity, isn't as uh, directly understandable as other pro other social problems right because we uh, a general an average person should understand somehow uh, how these uh, you know physical problems in our atmosphere uh, you know uh, go through different stages of the entire process and then reach us humans and then somehow uh, put their impact on us you know by causing some physical problems or health issues in our bodies uh, so and that's my understanding why it is not so quick or not so easy. Um, all right, uh, and I'm switching to an, uh, explaining you guys how uh, science looks at it. So first of all, let's talk about something called the carbon cycle. This is the cartoon that I found on the internet and uh, it clearly shows that in, the na in nature, in mother nature, we have like uh, two uh, balancing each other uh, you know, elements called carbon sinks and carbon sources. Carbon sources, they kind of produce or uh, emit carbon dioxide into the um, air while carbon sinks, they absorb carbon dioxide for their own use. And for example, in, in this picture, we have basically uh, forest fires and uh, changing the soil and the land use and melting of permafrost in the polar regions as well. They are like uh, releasing a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere while some of the CO2 in the atmosphere are absorbed into the oceans and in the forests and vegetation uh, and eventually into the soil as well. So in a perfect equilibrium situation, we have carbon dioxide levels, um, you know, more or less balanced. And I will later show how the CO2 levels in the atmosphere have, uh, have changed uh, over the course of hundreds of thousands of years. Okay, uh, now this is the this should be something in your uh, mind to understand how uh, like uh, carbon or carbon dioxide is balanced in nature. All right, so if you look at this graph, we have this uh, 800,000 year period, right? That should be uh, pretty interesting because this uh, level, this is the, uh, if you look at the Y axis, we are looking at the CO2 levels. For the hundreds of thousands of years, or almost like a million years, the uh, level has been more or less, uh, you know, more or less uh, the same, I would say, right? Uh, and with, of course, um, uh, ice ages uh, observed in the, in, the, in the meantime. And if you come back to the zero, which is now, we can see the level is like skyrocketing, you know, immediately. So this is the last uh, up to 100 years of our current history. So, and uh, the uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is measured in PPM. So it's another 
something similar to a percentage, right? So this, uh, if you can see the level here is, uh, has been increased by approximately 40 or more than 40%. All right. So this is the clear th um, uh, evidence that we are having carbon dioxide increase in the atmosphere. And another corresponding measure, which is the global temperature, uh, which shows clear, a clear correlation with the carbon dioxide. And I don't really want to go into detail why, which is the cause and which is the result, but the uh, international scientific community has already uh, come to one conclusion, like almost 97% of all the uh, climate scientists, that the global temperature rise is the uh, reason and carbon dioxide level levels uh, going up is the um, is the cause. Uh, well, some people also compare it with the uh, natural, um, you know, natural um, causes of glo of global warming with the human induced global warming, and this is one of the uh, evidence that shows that uh, it is mostly uh, the human induced induced global warming which is causing which is uh, which we are observing these days. The yellow line here is the solar irradiation. So we should see that uh, for the last, let's say, starting in from 1960s, the solar activity hasn't, you know, increased much, or it's like even decreasing and uh, in the like uh, the latest years, while the uh, temperature itself is going up. So we don't have good correlation between them. So there should be something else which is causing the um, global warming in, in this case. Well. Um, and another interesting uh, chart I have here is the is that it shows that, um, that um, if you look at the question, how have the IPCC report, reports changed through time? And IPCC uh, is um, an international panel for climate change. Uh, so this is the uh, organization formed in 1988, and it's uh, you know produces reports on the, the state of climate change and its reasons, and and most importantly, how we can tackle the problem and give specific advice uh, to uh, like governments of the world. Uh, and uh, so we, we said uh, like starting from 1990s uh, till now, you can see that the uh, more and more, there's been more and more evidence that it's been humans that have caused the recent uh, global warming. All right, so this is a very important chart by the, the same source, IPCC 2014 reports. Uh, here we have a very interesting thing uh, that in the atmosphere we have different uh, gases and some of them are called, those greenhouse gases, they are specific in a sense that they can absorb heat or energy, right? And that's why, for example, the, uh, like, in, in, in other words, um, uh, how you call it, um, infrared radiation or in other words, just heat, is coming, which is coming from the uh, the sun, and the heat which is going up from the ground into the atmosphere are trapped in the atmosphere. So these are the greenhouse gases, and these are the main types of those ga gases. And interesting question is, uh, which gas is the most, um, you know, has the most cap capability of storing heat? It is actually, even for example, in this case, methane can absorb more heat than carbon dioxide. But why we're only talking about carbon dioxide, not methane or other uh, gases in this case. But this is because, as, as you can see, almost like uh, more than three four, fourth of uh, three quarters of all the gas, all the uh, like gas, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are basically carbon dioxide. So we're talking about the concentration here. Uh, so that's why carbon dioxide is very, very important in this case. And in the next chart of the same report, we can see that. Uh, there are uh, some sectors of economy that causes most of the uh, uh, greenhouse emissions. We have electric electricity production, uh, agriculture, and so on and so on, and transportation, of course. And some of those uh, sectors uh, could be those uh, which you or me and every each and every one of us are directly related to, right? Uh, for example, transportation, we drive cars and so on. Uh, we fly on planes uh, and so on. And we eat meats, for example. And so on. Well, here's the thing uh, that shows um, uh, the uh, that uh, by 2100, we sh that we should uh, the, the the global community's goal has been to limit the uh, um, you know um, the green um, the annual average temperatures um, of the planet not more than two degrees compared to the pre-industrial age, which is like 1900s. Uh, so, but 
current situation is uh, this one. It's like the 2017 projection over here. And the emissions are still increasing, but to some uh, reports, according to some reports that I've looked at, that it shows that the the uh, you know the rates in, the the rate of uh, uh, you know CO2 emissions growth is slowing down a little bit, which is a really good um, thing to know. And coming back to the next part, I would say uh, the last part of my presentation is how to tackle uh, the climate change. Um, issue. All right. Uh, first of all, I this is my personal thesis, uh, and I think that the environmental problems, including climate change problems, uh, should not be addressed without economic concerns, because we see a lot of debate between the uh, business sector or like government sector, or even some environmentalists that they do not have, uh, do not you often have a, um, you know, uh, well thought consensus. That's why I Think that we should uh, put those um, groups of people together. Uh, and one solution was uh, has been a very good invention in the, uh, in for example, Europe and the United States, which is called a cap and trade thing. And the cap and trade models in Europe and uh, US um, are called respectively like this: the European Union emissions trading schedule. In other words, they uh, put a price on carbon. So in order to uh, emit CO2 into the atmosphere while producing something, you have to buy those allowances. You buy those allowances, and then you will have the right to emit CO2 into the atmosphere, which I find really, really interesting. So uh, the cap part, it means that the, uh, the total emissions within the country will be capped. So there will be a maximum uh, limit of total emissions, which is um, like allowed in the country by the government. And uh, like several gigatons of CO2, for example. And uh, the right to emit CO2 will be sold, of course, uh, on auction, for example, by the government and so on. Uh, this is something actually what I came across very recently and I found really amazing. And of course, it has a lot of uh, pros and cons. And I just uh, s tell people that it is something like, um, you know, uh, democracy, right? Uh, it's not perfect, <laughs> uh, but it it is something. Uh, but but the humanity has hasn't so far invented anything better yet. Uh, so it's got it's some co cons as well, and those cons are mostly economic. And the cap and trade systems they put environment first, which is really really uh, crucial here. And of course, if you have some other questions about the system, I can talk about it later in the Q&A section. Uh, so this is what we have in Uzbekistan, uh, unlike in like uh, developed countries, uh, like uh, Western and countries in the US or China, uh, we, don't, we do not contribute to the uh, global CO2 emissions very much. Um, that's why according to the Paris Agreement, Uzbekistan has agreed, has pledged to decrease CO2 levels by 10% uh, by 2030. So it's not like 20%, it's not 30%, it's just 10%. So it's can, it can be understandable somehow. And most, uh, uh, the sector which contributes the most to the CO2 emissions in Uzbekistan is the energy sector. It's like 89% over here. So, and uh, this is my final slide. Uh, this is something that uh, we, me uh, and uh, a, a specialist in the green building sector called uh, Timur Ahmedov produced uh, in, uh, in collaboration a conceptual proposal to make the, the uh, buildings of the University of Geosciences of Uzbekistan energy efficient or to uh, project the buildings or design the projects so that they have zero net energy uh, balance. And it's a very new thing for Uzbekistan. And by the way, this university uh, is uh, about to open in Uzbekistan this year, hopefully. So the university is being built from scratch. And we, uh, in the initial, in the initial uh, document that we've seen, it doesn't really consider the energy efficiency of the buildings. That's why we just came in and trying trying to somehow advocate on um, uh, you know green buildings um, uh, you know implementation in these um, buildings currently. So yeah, and uh, yeah, I mean uh, that's the end of my presentation. But uh, if you uh, have any questions, I can answer, and also have uh, in later in the Q and A section, I can also show you some. Um, 
like uh, websites, which I find really interesting. Thank you. Yeah, of course, of course, there are the, the, the questions we, we will address now, and which is also uh, the, the part that we were mentioning. And at the beginning, I will go back to that part that Anastasia Saharova was mentioning, because there is this responsibility that you were saying now with numbers and this kind of statistics regarding how uh, all the measures and all the, the things, of course, we have uh, not just as citizens, but also as countries, we have this responsibility of the carbon dioxide. And, and then there are a lot of, of different measures on how we can uh, address uh, this kind of, of studies. And it is, it is actually very important. And there are some questions that are already now on the, on the live uh, from our guests, that the, I mean, the, the viewers that are currently now watching this. And uh, let's go back. I will actually, that is the reason uh, to take on the discussion now again, Anastasia Saharova. So, how, and uh, we were saying, you, we can see that all these kind of approaches from uh, uh, not just society, civil society, but of, of course, uh, people who is currently in an institution and it, let's say a university who is uh, helping in a way uh, to also have like a specific uh, data, like also the one that Asamat just uh, present. So basically, and it, it was the, the last question before the, the opening of the discussion, how Russia and how you in the move green uh, and the go green the, from MGMO is uh, is currently uh, having those kind of specific examples on the on the studies on the environment. So specific examples of studies. Um, well, as far as I know, um, Department of uh, International Economic Relations have some research on um, on the problem of financing or climate change mitigation in Russia. Also research, um, not only in GIMO, but also in other uh, leading universities of the country, there are research on um, what impact are on the Russian economy will climate change have um, uh, when the uh, world economy is changing and adapting to climate change issues and how are, um, can, how can we transform our economy to uh, to adapt to it? And um, regarding the Paris Agreement, well, um, we have ratified it um, and um, every country should uh, make a like, volunteer national contribution um, to cutting the emissions of the of a country, and uh, Russia is now fulfilling its obligation. But it's not because we are so efficient, and uh, government does a uh, great action. It's because in the 90s our industry fell, and our emissions fell as well. Um, and this is why we are now like in track with our obligations under the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, but of course, we have challenges because uh, up to 40% of our economy depends on say, selling um, oil and gas, uh, fossil fuels. And that's really a problem um, because um, according to some estimates, like in 10 or 20 years, uh, there, there will be much lower demand for fossil fuel and we have to uh, to do something with that. Um, but I think that there are, there is no um, certain plan or uh, strategy of how we are going to do it. Uh, but as far as I know, there are developments in the government that um, like. They're considering how can we um, establish national or even international uh, market of uh, carbon emissions trading, price in carbon and uh, market mechanism of emissions trading. Uh, it's uh, in development currently, as far as I know, uh, but nothing, uh, nothing is clear yet. 
And we also have a law which uh, makes uh, corporations and companies use the best available technologies to be uh, resource efficient, to be energy efficient, not to pollute, not to, not to emit um, nor carbon nor other pollutants in the air or in the water. So uh, this is what from the side of the government. There are some actions, there are some, some something, some developments, but it's, uh, it's only in the way. From the side of the citizens, um, I think I, uh, I saw some data that uh, in 2019 or, yeah, 2018, uh, more than a half of Russian citizens are aware of the climate problem of climate change and are concerned. And uh, like I observe, I myself observe that more and more um, students or young people, adult people, my friends, my, uh, the people who I know, uh, they are concerned. Um, they're concerned and they try to reduce the amount of or, uh, their, the resources they use. Uh, we try to uh, separate the waste um, and uh, there, are, there is a uh, uh, emerging system of uh, separated uh, collection of waste in our country. It's not perfect yet, but it's also in development. Uh, more and more people go with uh, their own cups, uh, not to buy those uh, single-use plastic ones uh, to drink coffee or something. Um, and uh, there are more and more talks about that, about uh, environment, climate, and uh, that we all should be concerned and should do something about it, about that. So I see the progress, um, and uh, actually have an optimistic view of what is going on. I think that environmental advocacy works here. Thank you. That is, that is very important actually uh, to see on what uh, we will happen, of course, not just based on our own, um, yeah, let's say uh, what we are doing from, from different backgrounds, uh, what we are also sharing from science uh, the responsibility, as you said, not just as citizens, uh, taking a look on, on data, but on the actions. And, uh, and of course, uh, this vision on, for example, I will say and mention now, uh, we have, we have uh, 10 years from now, for example, to address one of the, uh, the biggest agenda on, on 17 different goals that you were mentioning also as well at the beginning. And uh, we will address them, but uh, uh, since 2012, they were having like an idea for, for now, uh, we didn't reach the goal of uh, reducing uh, as like on the level of the greenhouse uh, gas emission. And, and now we are entering into this decade of action. Well, that is important, of course, yes, Anastasia Zaharov, as you just said, um, we can see it with uh, with positive eyes. And that was also the, the point that uh, Fahad Alabi, you were mentioning. I mean, we can't do from any part of our, um, let's say, uh, life, uh, what we are doing. Uh, and, and you as, as this like leader and volunteer and founder of a, of a movement, well, it is not just watching on what the institution, what the government is doing, but also, this responsibility of a citizen. I, I, I want to go back with you also and, uh, on, on this. How do you see all this conversation, all this data that our colleagues just just share and how you are, are like dealing with all this? And of course, uh, what else, what kind of uh, like currently this action of the week we are doing? Well, we are like having this discussion, but uh, what else then, what, what else to do? I think um, we need to explain to people and to everyone that they are actually responsible in this environment. They're responsible in where they're living at and uh, they have to open their eyes to what really matters and what really they need more than what they really want. 
because you can see um, you have a big challenge when it comes to the commercial aspect. Uh, the commercial aspect always wants to sell and then that's uh, hit the huge wave and uh, the people will bu end up buying things and consuming things unnecessary. Uh, consumption is the biggest challenge of this world. Uh, uh, people starting to consuming things, even affecting their mental and their physical health. People have been highlighting a healthy mind and a healthy body, mind and body, mind and body, uh, but they don't realize that the mind and the body is also healthy when they are part of a healthy environment. So you can see the environment was always been in denial in many different practices. And we, we need just to, to, to introduce, I'm gonna say, the environment is an alien to some principles, but we need to reintroduce the environment again to the coming generations and this generation and to the consuming cultures, how important it is to have the environmental value in their lives. Because to be honest, to find the balance in your life, because after all, it's all about fighting balance. You're, we are fighting the balance about our economic and we're fighting with the balance with our climate change. We're fighting the balance with our own physical health, mental health, and going to the outs outdoors and going to get that fresh air. There is a huge big balance element we're trying to fight for it for every day, but we need to define it. And it's this very obvious that the environment is shifting out of balance. And we have to realize that makes us to realize that the environment is part of us and we are part of the environment because after all, the environment is what connects us all together. Today, everyone from different parts of the world we are having in the conference and what's connects us all together other than the internet is earth. And it's the only, the only <laughs> visible uh, thing that we can touch on and uh, it connects us all together. So we need to make sure what we are really empowering. It's a very big question, what we are really empowering. And people have to be aware what they are empowering. Social media has become a very good tool, but also to the, uh, to the market and the consuming uh, culture has become very manipulated with the social media. And I believe we are living at the moment one of the biggest times of life where the emotions of a human being been mainly manipulated or abused. Every promoting, every, any media material will come in, will try to manipulate people's heads and then they will end up buying more or buying less in the door of fear, in the door of interest, in the door of, and people end up less insecure simply because they don't know how to live the real them. So we've been living, we've been living on the surface of our own skins for too long, and we don't know really what do we really need. We just been living every day based on what we want. And that's in a bigger scale, it's gonna affect on what we are really consuming and what we are really buying and what we are getting. So, uh, Coming back to how we can bring this all into balance. Uh, yes, I mean, sometimes crisis like the COVID-19 can, can be an eye opener to what we need, especially when everyone has been locked down and people are understanding what do they really want and what they really need. And you cannot differentiate between what you want and what you really need only when you are under pressure, under pressure. But when you're relaxed and you're consuming easily, you will just consume and you, you start to feel, to want what you feel. And what you want you feel is what you'll be manipulated from a market. So bringing all that together, we have to just to realize and people to be educated more about, to have more emotional connection with the environment. People, we need to bring more emotional element and value to the environment. I can see there is no emotional value to the environment. People would care more how they would look like People would care more about how they would, uh, what car they would drive. People would care more what clothes they would wear. People would care more about which uh, country they're taking the selfies with. But they wouldn't care about how this environment is. Environment is always second or third in their list. That's if they exist in this, if that's if the environment exists on their list. And that's a huge deal. One of the biggest challenges now I'm really fighting in my own country is the masks. People have ended up throwing masks sometimes on the floor. And that brings another question. The, the, was, the, was this the COVID-19 was enough to make an eye opener to them and to waking them or not? So we need to, we need to 
educate people more, but also not only educate them, we need to make them aware and we need to start to build an emotional value to the environment. I think it's very important. Lots of people having anxiety, lots of people, they are lost within themselves. Lots of people, they are scared to get outside and to enjoy nature. They don't know what's the value of nature. So how we can bring that, we need to start to have more practices bringing the environmental importance to ourselves. After all, and I always keep saying this, a healthy mind and a healthy body and a healthy environment. And I'm saying this based on even my background is an, is an athlete and I'm also a fitness instructor. And I'm always looking, people are caging their practice. It's only in a gym or in a studio, but what happened to the outdoors? When you go to a hike, when you're going for a swim in a lake, when you're going to swim in the sea, when you go for a dive, there's a huge world, part of this world we are missing. And it's simply the environment that we're living in. And we need to bring that value back to people. That is, that is the essence. That is the essence. And now we are, well, uh, the four of us from different countries. And as you just said, well, what happened now in, in Oman, people also here in Mexico, throwing the masks uh, away. Uh, this is a reconfiguration. This is a new beginning of, uh, of uh, yeah, I mean, the whole world was uh, uh, stopped from, from this uh, new crisis, something uh, we were not able to understand at the beginning and uh, little by little. Uh, now we can have this opportunity of going out, but with a different mindset. And, uh, and then, well, of course, taking backwards or uh, uh, thinking also in our history and the things we have been doing, uh, not just as an individual, but also as the decisions, what the, the decision makers uh, has been uh, deciding, of course, and, and having as an idea of what will be the future of each nation and uh, at the end of the whole uh, international concert of, of states and uh, and uh, countries all over the world. And that is actually, I will say, something we can link all together. Yes, we are now uh, uh, with Anastasia from Russia. We are now with uh, Samad from Uzbekistan and with you, Fahad, from Oman. And and we are like trying to to lead this conversation on, uh, well, now I'm, I'm, I'm in, Me in Mexico. I'm based here in a Latin American country. And there are a lot of things, of course, that if we go back to what our ancient uh, ancestors they were doing, uh, well, there is also a way of living, and uh, and that we can learn from it, and of course adapt it. That is that is actually very important. And there are some questions that they were very very interesting now uh, regarding also the the situation on how every country is is having this kind of. Uh, of emissions and also the responsibility on them. And it, I think this was, uh, I'm gonna to, to open the, the discussion just for this question because it can be answered from any of you, uh, for the three of you actually, not any, but for the three of you. The question that it's on live now, it's like, um, what is the, the relation of this uh, responsibility of each country, but of the, of the GDP? and the greenhouse emissions uh, referring to the economy, I will say the economy in Oman, the economy in Uzbekistan, and the economy in Russia. Uh, dear Asamad, I will go with you uh, for, for this first question and I will keep on the on the following aspect with uh, Nestesh and finally Pat. All right, all right. Um, thank you for the question. So as far as I understand the question, we are talking about um, the relationship between um, uh, the uh, you say you're we're talking about the GDP of the country and um, the uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, within the country, right? Uh, uh, and ju uh, just like Fahad, uh, I can say that um, I'm not a uh, you know student student with a background in climate science. Um, I am just like him. I'm a very curious learner and a self learner. learner. Uh, my basic uh, you know exper ex uh, expertise is basically in. Uh, it was first in uh, finance and later in geology and currently in uh, glaciology, so studying glaciers, basically. <laughs> but I've been really, really curious in um, the global and uh, national environmental problems regarding climate change. So, uh, and Fahad also mentioned the term uh, 
uh, you know, capitalism in the discussion of climate change is really, really important uh, because uh, we are living in a, um, you know, consuming uh, worlds. So consumerism is one of the drivers that is, um, you know, uh, producing more and more uh, greenhouse emissions into the atmosphere. But uh, when, when I talk about Uzbekistan, I know that Uzbekistan is not a big contributor to the uh, climate crisis problem, but it is still contributing. Um, and, and we know that Uzbekistan is a uh, uh, lower middle income country. And in, according to the World Bank, we have four classes of countries, right? Uh, low, low income countries and uh, middle income and the uh, high income countries. And the middle income countries are divided into sub two subcategories: categories, lower and higher middle income countries. So we are, if you have the scale from one to four, Uzbekistan is uh, number two. So it's not a very rich country. And we can see, uh, according to a lot of studies, the very, very good correlation between the, uh, say, uh, gross national income per capita income uh, and the uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, it is according to the actually the um, United Nations data that I uh, saw, uh, you know, a couple of months ago, it shows a very, very good correlation uh, in the world, depending on the country, right? Uh, if the country has higher GNI or gross national income per capita, it's going to have higher greenhouse gas emissions. But this means more money a nation has, it has got a more capability to produce more. And as our production and manufacturing is heavily based on uh, or fossil fuels while producing, right? Producing, uh, you know, anything, manufacturing or producing energy like electricity, right? It is heavily based on fossil fuels, mostly, um, uh, you know, oil and uh, coal, I would say, which are the top pollutants uh, of the atmosphere. Um, and yeah, in Uzbekistan, again, uh, it is an, the, still the major factor that is contributing to the global, uh, the climate change uh, in our country, which is energy sector, basically. Uh, so, um, and uh, uh, as per the numbers, I don't have the numbers, the exact numbers so far, because I'm, I haven't really done any research on that. But, uh, uh, but uh, as a part of my uh, current um, like answer or speech, I'd like to share some of the things that I really, really wanted to share with you guys um, earlier. So I just wanna uh, share uh, my screen for a couple of minutes. Um, Antonio, can you uh, enable the, uh, Screen sharing function, please. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So uh, what I'm going to be sharing is basically um, some of the websites, which are really, really good sources. Can you guys see it? Yeah. So uh, as you, if you remember in my presentation, I started with the uh, scientific aspects or scientific explanation of climate change. And actually, uh, another problem that I have been tackling in my personal life was um, climate change deniers, right? So we, we, even if we're uh, living in the, in the world where climate change has been discussed a lot, but there are still climate change deniers who just, you know, uh, blindly say, okay, there's no climate change problem and we're good to go. <laughs> so this is a website, Skeptical Science. Uh, dot com you can uh, you know google it very easily it is a website it's a blog actually that that uh, gives you the links to the uh, state of the art science which actually tries to uh, debust the myths or the the claims which are scientifically false it tries to falsify all those myths and show the true answer according to the uh, peer-reviewed science uh, so another uh, source i would like to uh, show you guys is the uh, this one uh, drawdown project drawdown means we have a lot of like carbon dioxide in the atmosphere right and we have to uh, like in most of the uh, like human induced co2 emissions are basically uh, taking everything which is stored in the ground and put it into the atmosphere right and the drawdown project is uh, planning like uh, it has an aim to do the opposite take all the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and bury it in the ground. And very good thing about the website is that it's, it's a very good uh, climate advocacy website. Uh, it can be used by the government, by the private private sector. And here it's, it's got a se section called solutions. Uh, when you go to the solution, there's a table of solutions. Table of solutions under this uh, 
uh, page, you can see this list. Uh, this is a very, very uh, detailed uh, science and it's uh, like reviewed, I think, uh, regularly. So if you can see, uh, it, it is, uh, copyright, um, is copyrighted in 2020. It's very, very fresh. And uh, it's got actually two scenarios. Scenario one is the uh, scenario when we have a glob global climate uh, temperatures, a uh, global uh, annual temperatures uh, uh, increase by 1.5 degree, uh, two degrees, and the scenario two is 1.5 degrees. And it shows that uh, we have a lot of solutions in the first column, like reduce food waste and so on and so on. And each of these solutions can reduce uh, uh, several, like a specific number of uh, gigatons from the atmosphere, atmosphere and bury it into the ground. And I just uh, like, you know, uh, try to sort it um, according to the solution, according to this um, measurement and according to the, the table, reduced food waste is the best solution according to their research, best solution to tackle the CO2 uh, carbon uh, climate crisis problem, problem, which is uh, very interesting, for example, right? And, um, and another thing that I found uh, really interesting was it was somewhere here, I can't uh, really see it here, I guess. It was the educating, um, educating um, uh, women and girls. That was an, another uh, solution over here, but I can't really show it right now, which actually got me really surprised. Educating girls and women actually uh, is going to have a very a good estimated uh, solution of the uh, global climate change. All right, uh, the, the, I got three more. Uh, I'll go through them very uh, quickly. So this is the IPCC website, ipcc.ch, which where you can find also the reports for free and th those can be used uh, as advocacy uh, papers for governments. And the next one is uh, another uh, good website, which is um, uh, the website of European Union Emissions uh, Trading System. It actually shows how it is done and what it means and uh, what uh, results the system has achieved. It has actually been very, very successful so far. Um, and it says that um, they are going well beyond the goals. So this meaning that their uh, efforts have been really, really successful. And we can also learn a lot from them, from the cap and trade system. And, and the last one is another interesting website, but it's not very important. Just wanted to tell you uh, one conclusion they made about the cap and trade system. So they say the cap and trade system uh, was very efficient in the European Union territory, uh, which uh, according as a result, uh, the CO2 emissions declined by 13% for 20 years, which is a good result, but the carbon footprint increased by 8%. So that was the, uh, one of the things that, I, that uh, you know, caught my attention. And that's, that was because the cap and trade is basically focused on production not consumption. This means, okay, in the country, uh, as a producer, I cannot uh, uh, emit more uh, CO2 into the atmosphere. And therefore, what I do is basically import uh, ready products from abroad. And in another country, like in Africa, for example, uh, they might produce things or manufacture things uh, by, you know, uh, like emitting a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So they might have very, very, bad carbon footprint in those countries. So some European producers might just simply import those products uh, instead of producing them locally uh, by uh, you know, bypassing this um, limitations. So uh, their uh, you know, uh, final conclusion was that we should not only focus on production, but also on consumption as well. That was a very, very good point. And in this regard, I've been really concerned about uh, making food production local. Again, making food production uh, local, like both production and consumption, because that's the basic things that we do. I and mean, we don't have to have very, very, like, uh, you know, uh, high level technology to produce food, right? It's not a high tech business. So food as a very basic need, I think uh, should be encouraged to be produced and consumed locally. Yeah, that's the points that I really wanted to share with you guys. Awesome, Asamat. 
also awesome. That is also actually one of the of the things that we can. Uh, yeah, it leads us to a to a very interesting uh, part for for the last session or yeah moments of on our discussion and as you said as, as conclusions Anastasia Saharova same question and same address uh, to you thank you well everything that Azamat said is uh, extremely right and important uh, they are important findings I would also like to add uh, something about a thing called uh, decoupling um, decoupling GDP growth from our um, carbon emissions. What does it mean? It means that um, the growth of uh, the GDP of the country uh, rises faster than its carbon emissions or carbon emissions may even decline. And uh, when that decoupling is uh, happening, uh, the curves just go in different uh, directions and the gap between them uh, became bigger. And uh, this is uh, possible. Uh, we know that for sure, and it is happening in some countries. Uh, of course, in uh, the developed countries, mostly, because uh, it demands a lot of funding, financial resources and technologies and so on. Yes, um, it's difficult, but uh, at least we know that it's possible. Uh, I uh, do not know the exact numbers for Russia as well. I do not have them just right now. Um, but <laughs> the campaign is not happening here. Um, and what else? Or uh, what I wanted to say is that um, we should always consider the politics as well uh, and history and uh, all the national mm, conditions. Um, that countries have. Uh, it's really hard, it's really difficult to, to cut the emissions and to make that decoupling possible uh, from both sides, from production, from consumers. Um, and this is why we need international cooperation and the IPCC and that framework convention on climate change and so on. Uh, I also think that uh, consumption is uh, one of the important uh, elements of that. And uh, I personally think we need uh, like the mm, labels on products uh, with uh, figures uh, what carbon footprint uh, does a certain product uh, uh, does a certain product have uh, has. Um, and then if uh, the consumers see that label uh, and how uh, carbon dirty, so, so to say, it is, we can make our informed choices and uh, do something. But yeah, we still have a basic rule, buy local. Um, it's really right. And uh, not only uh, in relation to food, but also cloths and uh, all other things we consume, we should try to buy local. And uh, I also oh, had, oh, no, um, I, I'd like to jump to a little bit, another topic, so please. Yeah, cool. Uh, we just want to uh, refer to what you said earlier regarding the, um, uh, the consideration of implement, um, implementing um, like uh, emission trading in Russia. You said that it is being considered and it's not there yet, but it's being considered, right? But right. Uh, in, in Uzbekistan, what, we, what, what I did was um, I just uh, joined one of the conferences, which was hosted by many uh, local uh, economic researchers and uh, government officials as well. I just joined the Zoom meeting and asked the same question. It was about the related questions, issues. And uh, the answer I got, I received was that uh, we don't really know and uh, for Uzbekistan, it might be too early to think about it and stuff like that. And I just um, pointed out that, of course, we are not a really developed or wealthy country like European countries or the United States. Uh, they can allow themselves to uh, do to uh, you know spend money on like green technologies or, or implementing uh, cap and trade systems, for example. 
but we can't do it right now. That's your argument, right? But should we do, uh, like, should we go, uh, you know, sh through a short shortcut and start thinking about it right now? Or should we wait another 20 years <laughs> when it is kind of too late and then think about it? But still, I don't have the answer to the question from the uh, research institutions. And what, what uh, really, uh, you know, surprised me was that the research institutions should be still studying it, right? I'm not talking about the government uh, offices, agencies. I'm talking about the researchers. Why are you not studying at least? So that was my first concern. And um, yeah, and another thing was that when I was uh, dealing with um, such stuff uh, uh, on another conference, I also raised another question. It's still uh, not, not answered perfectly. It was the fact that Uzbekistan adopted a an energy concept for the next, I uh, think, 10 years from now. And according to it, they're going to increase the share of renewable energies and uh, other sources. I mean, other, um, uh, you know, uh, like carbon, carbon, uh, zero carbon energy resources, but still they are tr planning to uh, increase the share or the amount of coil, amount of coil used in electricity production. That was that was really surprising. It's the dirtiest, you know, pollute, pollutant of the of the of the air, and you're trying to increase it. How come? They're trying to decrease oil but increase coil. What? <laughs> that was very weird. But I don't still have the answer. So I try to maybe try my best to push uh, this question forward. Yeah, it's a lack of uh, comprehensive climate policy national climate national policy um well uh yeah i think that uh us, our government and scholars should consider um the possibility of uh, establishing a carbon emissions market in countries uh well at least we must study that how um uh, can we make it or not or uh, how can we make it, how it will work, uh, and so on. And I think we should try, make uh, experiments and so on. And uh, in the end, it depends or, on uh, like private companies, right? Uh, it will be their responsibility to cut those emissions, to buy our uh, carbon credits and so on. And maybe it will, it will be a good incentive for them to uh, invent new technologies why buy maybe you should spend a little money for research and find uh, your own way yeah. to reduce emissions so i think uh it's it's needed and uh, uh actually in russia we uh, yeah we on track with our responsibilities under paris agreement but uh they still consider that uh carbon market and I think it's the right right thing to do yeah, as, uh, as, a, as a final point I just want to mention that uh, you know talking about the uh, emission um, opening a emission market or putting a price on carbon is a really good thing because it is a really good you know uh, as you said uh, a, a bargaining or consensus somehow right between the economic and environmental stakeholders which is a really good thing it's not going to uh, tell the people, okay, do not use um, fossil fuels. Uh, it's not about imposing an idea or it's not about banning people from doing something, right? Or preventing from people from doing things, but instead giving an incentive uh, right. to them to do things right, right? To switch to green technologies, which is a really, really good um, innovation, I think. That is why it is called uh, like flexible mechanisms are in Kyoto Protocol and Paris Agreement. Yes, it's based on market or laws of or how market works. Uh, yeah, uh, I wanted to add that uh, uh, we, we Mgimo goes green and Mgimo, we uh, once we uh, hold a meeting with an activist of Friday for Future. They are Russian, um, like uh, section. Uh, you know uh, about Fridays for Future, right? That the movement Greta Thunberg started, and which is uh, now everywhere in the world, um, and here in Russia too. Uh, they go um, stand with those 
are uh, stand uh, in front of their uh, administration of the president, in front of the government, uh, embassies, and so on. And they do their thing. So, but they are. Mm, it's it's uh, difficult for them sometimes. Um, some our citizens do not support them. Some do, um, and uh, initially, uh, when I met one of the, uh, the activists, I noticed that they had uh, a little bit of lack of knowledge of uh, what is going on, of the issue of climate change and climate policy, and it was all about emotions. Uh, and it was still very good, but uh, time uh, passes and they actually learn uh, and uh, they like they receive new knowledge about that and they uh, give it to, back to people and more and more uh, people are getting involved. And I think that's wonderful. Uh, I'm not sure if it's really efficient um, uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, uh, impact on the uh, politicians and uh, those who uh, make decisions. But uh, they actually had a meeting with uh, one of the politicians and they had the conversation. Uh, was it productive or not? I'm not sure, but uh, it is, um, as a fact, it is good as well. Yeah, and they um, actually do that climate advocacy for citizens. They uh, disseminate that knowledge, and I think that's great as well. Yes, yeah, exactly. And that is actually, uh, oh my God, the, uh, now we, we have turned this uh, also, and, and there was also another thing very important, which is uh, decoupling. Uh, is Russia doing, and you were saying, uh, we will, are we decoupling these these two things? And there are and now I will I will mention just uh, because it is important uh, all all the live uh, comments and and the and the greetings that uh, we should do to Sanhar Saidov who is also participating on this discussion, saying that the margins in between production and consumption are far be re beyond on our imaginations and. Uh, well, yeah, we are, maybe we don't want to change and we close our, that is what uh, Sanhar Saidov is saying. And also we say hello to uh, Germán Lombardero, who is following also and the, all the other uh, active uh, people who is watching the live. Uh, we have turned these uh, very, very expertise and uh, a lot of data, a lot of uh, terms that uh, people should should be using, not just the the experts or the people who is studying. And as, as we just mentioned, well, Anastasia Anastasia she is uh, a graduate from an environmental uh, bachelor. Uh, Asamad is from geology. Uh, Fahad, uh, you are uh, more on an activist, and you have other backgrounds. You have uh, a movement as well uh, related to to the hand stop uh, movement and this. Uh, uh, go green and uh, move green. It is. It is also one thing we have become in this conversation very expertise. But uh, that will be the, the last the last question, and I will go with you, Fahad. Now, uh, so how do you see this this whole thing that is happening? I mean, uh, definitely, as uh, how Anastasia said, um, the situation needs a better understanding in international relations. Because when we say international relations, we're talking about policy making and we're talking about history. We need to know how we can take this thing forward. We need to learn how we can find new policies to make us find a better collective effort towards carbon emission or a climate change problem. And I will go as well with Azmat when he said and highlighted the climate change could be not the problem, the problem could be the climate crisis. And we need to focus more of it, more of a term as a climate crisis rather than a climate change. But that's an opinion, in my opinion. And I hope uh, if someone agrees with me in this, because if we are not able to face our policies and our history, if we are not able to define the problem properly, if we are not able to realize that we are part of the environment and this is what connects us all together, this is going to be forever a challenge. 
And regarding to your previous question as well, I think the question of the GDP is a bit um, early a bit because most of the countries at the moment, they're trying to develop their uh, strategies of how to do it. And uh, I would say every country is trying to create a value out of the, for the market to, to change the way how we are going and to build a new value is what we have. And I think this is also related to the Corona situation or the COVID-19 is we are trying to explore, to explore more and more values. Things are shifting to digitalization. The earth start to breathe a bit, a bit more. So maybe this is opportunity to bring the international relations and policy making and uh, defining more problems and empowering more collective effort from an individual level to a different organization point of view. So, um, this is my opinion, my friend. That is, that is. And, and finally, well, Fahad, uh, we were actually also trying to share again some of these examples of the, of the, um, yeah, well, let's say um, different, different ways of uh, uh, acting and, um, and telling people how, how to go. And I don't know if it's, if it's able that you are watching uh, right now to play yeah. the video. Let me see because I think you are. <laughs> so, the, so what's so what's happening here is that the little the little jingle or the song became the material in different schools. That just shows us how much of our education needs more of a materials to build emotional values for the environment because these are the coming future. And I always kept saying, if you want to change this world, you either be a child or either you inspire a child. And, and this is how change, this is how change happened. We just have, we just have to grow up in this. And um, most likely we always have to highlight the environmental value or to start to build an environmental value. And I think our solution to this world is actually building an environmental value, no matter what size it is, but it should inspire us to bring something out of this and to try, as how Stacey said, we have to give it a try. As how Asmin says, we have to define the number and we need to bring all of this together. This is the upcoming future. This is from Yemen. Can you imagine? This is from Yemen. It's mm -hmm. like a country on a war and an unstable political situation. Yes. And it becomes now uh, the hope. Hope you can uh, uh, still watch these because. Yeah. This is a school in Sana'a, in Sana'a at the moment. This is how their schools is. And speaking of education, which is, as I highlighted, one of the websites says education or women uh, is going to affect the environmental risk. I would say that's for sure, because um, I realized myself, one of the best leading uh, initiative of to bring in awareness, there's nothing really going to be stronger than a woman especially in a civilized uh, areas, women are the strongest awareness leaders. This is it because they have a huge different energy to translate an emotional value to a figure and they have the strength to, to translate any kind of a fact or information to an emotional value to society. They are the mothers of our houses, they are the sisters of ours, they are the wives of ours. So. Absolutely, a woman have a huge value in society to bring an information to an emotional value to it. The problem is we couldn't see it too much because we are so focused on our new devices, phones and social media platforms. We just have to know how to direct this and we need more of an emotional awareness. We need more of an emotional awareness. We became a victim of a marketing materials, manipulating our heads to be just hungry consumers to whatever we want, but not what we need. My dear Fahad, that is intense, and that is actually uh, uh, the 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 essence and the then the final goal of also all these kind of uh, actions that we are doing. I will just uh, share one more time uh, in order to to go in our last, I will say maybe the last question for for us and because of the time, and I, I mean. I know we can continue on, but it's really late where you are now. But uh, and yes, this is this is the last uh, one of the last examples I will I will show now. Learn it, everybody. Are you ready? I said, uh, oh, you 
So this is a little event, a little small event we did. We brought all the kids, we made a small song for climate change. It's all about sharing love. Ignore my funny voice. It's all about the message. <laughs> And this is one also one of the of the um, um, yeah these uh, examples that you you um, you show in our um, in the in one of the last uh, um, festivals or I mean not, it was a forum of the future teen movement so well another another way of, of touching souls and touching hearts and uh, and that is that is one one of the of the goals as we were saying. Absolutely, absolutely. It's all about sharing love. I'll keep it as hippie out sound. <laughs> sure, sure. So, uh, my dear, all all of you, and and this will be maybe the last address for for each of you. And uh, uh, I guess from all our sides, uh, and uh, we have different uh, points on uh, how we can um, create on our family, on our friends, and our society. Uh, a mindset of well having an environmental advocacy which was the the subject of today and having of course an environmental awareness on uh, the different actions we can we can do um there will be two questions on the on the same uh, just uh, final final part one will be do you think the COVID-19 has uh, changed anything in us towards the environmental goals? Uh, are we uh, better now? Are we worse? But what are we uh, having after uh, uh, COVID-19, like a global crisis? And from each of you uh, who is like doing maybe is research, maybe is activism, maybe is uh, uh, volunteering in different ways, what else what society and what me as a, as a citizen from from russia and having international cooperation can do towards the the accomplishment of these um, environmental goals um excuse me can you uh, repeat the question sure so basically as a sum up, um, if you see uh, the crisis of the COVID-19, how it has affected uh, uh, and are we better or are we having, you were saying, Anastasia, for example, that you have a, a good vision, like a positive vision towards the next years regarding environmental um, actions. But okay. how COVID-19 has affected this? Uh, and the other one is, what will you do just as a, as a citizen, uh, not just from Russia, but as a global citizen? Well, uh, actually, regarding COVID-19 effect, uh, I am a pessim rather a pessimist because, uh, well, COVID-19 uh, hit hard uh, on people and their income and many Millions of people uh, loses, lose their jobs and their income, and it's really bad. And government, governments spend uh, a lot, a lot of millions on supporting the system, on recovering the economy. Um, and I think this is why social issues will took the first place in all the agendas, and uh, environment will be a little bit in shade and uh, yeah that I think that there, there will be the problem with uh, financing of the environmental initiative and action actually mm, so um, yeah that's a bit of gloomy perspective but this is how I see it as now uh, but 
uh, as uh, just like uh, the previous financial crisis of 2008, I think th this will um, like encourage people to uh, be a little bit more conscious, conscious or about their spendings and people will try to like uh, be economical and uh, save money not to waste them on all that unnecessary things just because we will have uh, lower income uh, and it may help and some trends from the uh, 2008 crisis uh, remained for example uh, agricultural tourism, uh, buying local, buying, um, buying in second hands and so on, uh, and uh, like being minimalist, this all came from that financial crisis. And I think that maybe that uh, pandemic will also add some uh, such, uh, you know, such solutions to everyday life of people. Um, and it will somehow improve the situation. For sure, for sure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Spasib, as well. Uh, Asamad, I go with you now. Yeah, all right, thank you. Uh, very good uh, points by um, uh, Anastasia. Um, I just uh, share most, uh, most of her um, uh, you know, opinion and ideas. Um, and I just want to point out that Coming back to uh, talking about the COVID-19 and its effects, maybe um, it's uh, like, you know uh, important lesson that uh, the the pandemic has taught us could be twofold in my view. Uh, one is that um, it just like Fahad told us earlier, the 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 pandemic showed us what is uh, what should be, in other words, our top priority, what uh, our basic needs are. Uh, as opposed to our like secondary needs, this that was a really good um, you know um, lesson that the pandemic has taught us. And another point is that um, it showed us that international, like like uh, literally global collaboration, is possible, right? And we, uh, as a global community, has tried to do our best to tackle this problem and in in order for the virus not to spread more. But of course, we have some. Uh, troubles and problems of still, but it showed us that the global collaboration, like quick international collaboration, is not impossible. It is rather possible. Uh, but the difference from the uh, environmental crisis and uh, the, the difference of the environmental crisis from the COVID uh, crisis could be different. Uh, could be that. Um, a lot of people, almost all people, understand the threat of a virus, right? So if I don't react, I'm gonna die in a couple of like day, uh, in a couple of months, right? That's why I have to react. But when it comes to the climate crisis, not everybody understands it. Even the uh, like almost hundred percent of the scientific community understand it. The general public still doesn't uh, understand it to the fullest. Like fifty, or it could be around fifty percent, as far as I remember according to the US statistics, that 50% um, of the general public believes that human caused climate crisis is, is real. So yeah, so this is, the base, this is basically the, the two things that I can point out regarding um, what COVID-19 has taught us. Again, it's, um, it showed us that uh, there are uh, things that we should put on priority and the second thing, it showed us that international collaboration is possible. And just want to point out one more thing, uh, talking about the climate crisis. We also have an international collaboration called uh, the uh, Paris Agreement, for example. And uh, some, it has already received a lot of critics by the specialists. One of them could be that, uh, you know, it's, it's not a binding contract, right? It's like gifts the people like uh, encourages the government, encourages the governments to cut on emissions, for example, right? And each country should uh, pledge on, uh, you know, the carbon cuts, uh, carbon emissions cuts. For example, Uzbekistan has uh, promised that it's going to uh, cut its emissions by 10%. And the United States, it could be 25% or, and so on. And according to uh, one of the studies, uh, 
all the uh, promises made by all the governments, according to the Paris Agreement, is still not enough. If all the promises, all the targets are met by all individual countries, then we are going to uh, hit the three degrees Celsius target, not even two degrees Celsius. So that's uh, still kind of too bad. And uh, if my, uh, my uh, thought on this would be that we can do, what we can do as individuals is that, first of all, uh, it's again, twofold. Uh, first thing we can do is uh, we can change our own lifestyle. As Anastasia said, we can go minimalistic in whatever we do in, in our consumption, for example. And, uh, and uh, the, the second uh, thing we can do is to be more responsible citizens. Uh, so if there is any chance of, get, of engaging in a conversation with the government officials, for example, don't just pass them by and just stop by and just uh, like uh, ask questions or show your, uh, show your environmental position. For example, Uzbekistan has set 10% goal. And if there's any kind of conversation or a conference, I'll just raise my hands and ask why not to push this uh, you know, to 15% instead of 10, for example. So that's uh, what I um, would uh, you know, say about um, the, both the COVID-19 and how we can react to the current uh, you know, recovery, uh, I mean, the current uh, climate crisis after the recovery. After, after, right. That is, that is correct. And Fahad, finally, I, I go with you. Well, I would say uh, it's very obvious that the COVID-19 doesn't know anyone's religion or nationality or uh, race or color. Uh, the COVID-19 was a huge challenge and test on exam of humanity. So I would believe that uh, compassion is very important to survive with just as how money is. So compassion is important. Um, we can see many of the countries has went for self-efficiency and that was one of the most um, challenges I think and I believe that we will face uh, soon but I hope that doesn't really becomes something to grow on because most of the countries start to uh, do their own thing from their own self. And this is not only from a country's level, it's also from individual's level, from an individual level. So you will start to see the tree inside your, your, your house, a tomato, or, uh, you'll be less independent on the market and you will start to look for your normal survival need, which is, which is normal. This, this is a survival need. You need to create your own independency, but also we need uh, how to be more creative in, uh, how to collaborate, or as, or as Matt said, and how, to, how Anastasia said as well. We need to find more mechanisms of how we can communicate and to connect more together and to empower collaboration, because I believe this time it will be very hard time for people to collaborate with each other because most of the directions looks like going for self-sufficiency more. From an SDG perspective, I believe uh, it shows us that the health and well-being and climate action is in the emergency level. And it's very obvious that most of the victims of the COVID-19 who are actually not healthy very well. And it shows us also, most of the people who are struggling with hitting the targets of their climate action, they will, have, they will probably face also different challenges. And that's gonna be regarding based on the Paris Agreement as well. From a social entrepreneur and as an entrepreneur and also as a fitness instructor, I will tell you this from a personal point of view, I find out the best way to survive now is digitalization. I mean, uh, we are using Zoom at the moment, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. What really connects us now is digitalization, uh, application form. This is the, the revolution of the economy at the moment. And I think there are lots of, there's lots of values of economy going to change and Perhaps the old gold that we used to know before is going to be a different new gold. I don't know about that. I'm not a specialist, but this is what I can see at the moment. I'm delivering my service through Zoom. I'm today connecting with you guys through Zoom. And um, we don't know how that's going to be. It's very obvious. There's a lot of things going to be changed in terms and policies, of course. And we have to reconsider, of course, history as how in stage you said, this is international relations, I would say, in a you know, one word, we have to consider our policies of how to work together. And we have to put now more than any time ever to learn how to work to, with each other. And um, this is from a personal 
experience what I'm really telling you at the moment, guys, and especially my movement has slowed down and I had to go digital. Um, I had to, to start to train my clients digital. Um, so this is the this is the new phase now, and uh, nature is becoming now more uh, appealing, healthier, less pollution. That's the bright side of this. We should honor that, and we should consider that uh, as we are coming or phasing out of the COVID nineteen, or we starting to travel, or we starting now. Let's just say to get out to the outside, we start to learn. Now we have to learn how to honor that. I think the world needs to learn how to honor that. I just personally was pissed because I started to say masks on the ground, but <laughs> but we have to start to learn how to honor the the environment that we are in. Important part, of course, and the learning and also what we have after all this. I will ask you uh, to all of you to uh, open your mics for this last uh, uh, part that we are well already saying. Uh, good night, and uh, maybe it's still a uh, day here in Mexico, but each of you, you're presenting ideas, you're presenting uh, expertise, you're presenting as well data and, and different sites on examples how to address this. We think that also after a crisis, we can come up with uh, something uh, which will be an impact uh, to our society, and we can we can see it as a, as an opportunity, or we can just uh, not do anything and not learn, as you just said, Fahad, at the end, from from what we have been doing and what we can do. Uh, also, as uh, all of you just mentioned, uh, there are a lot of things, and those specific goals, we can address them from any on our our expertise and our actions. Well, so that's it, and um, that is that is why uh, there was also another thing you were mentioning, international cooperation. And yes, I think uh, this example, this very, very uh, example of opening a week of environmental uh, debates, conferences, uh, meetings, uh, that you were the, the ones who opened this discussion for all the rest of the actions that we will have, is this, and uh, well, maybe maybe of course in the future now that we can go on the streets again keep on on doing some examples on on testing or whatever actions towards our environmental awareness earth um, this is the other way around earth connects us very good one <laughs> my dear anastasia Спасибо большое, тоже Асамат, Толипов и Фахад, Шукрам. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you to all of you guys. De nada. Have a good Thank afternoon, you. have a good night or good morning, whatever you have in your time zones. Antonio, Fahad, Nastya. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for that conversation. Thank you. Good night over there and a big hug virtual now. And thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so we will stay in touch and see you next time. Thank you.